great concert, certainly um, a workout, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, without a doubt. Um, um, tell me, because you already talked, I mean, I want to talk about the pieces we've already told us um, quite a bit, but um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, too, and particularly, not just how you became a pianist, but became, became doing entirely new music, which is a very, you know, it's, it's a great thing, it's sort of unusual thing. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> the thing was that um, I, I always uh, listened to a lot of music. Uh, my father was really into uh, Viennese school, so I hired the Mozart, Beethoven. Uh, Is she a musician? Or? Uh, not no, a no, professional just one, but uh, just, just a pretty good pianist. And my father, uh, he used to, to like pop music a lot, so I heard Eric Clapton and Dire Straits and all those things. Uh, all, all at the s well, not at the same time, but uh, <laughs> that would be Charles Ives, but, uh, but very close. And um, so, uh, yeah, I was fascinated by that. And um, I, I always had to do, uh, like uh, well, many people, like Mozart, Haydn, these people, the composers. And I, I liked it, but I didn't quite get, honestly, why Mozart was considered to be such a genius. I mean, I was then 12, 13 years old. So <laughs> I thought it was relatively, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, predictable music in a way. Uh, of course, I mean, when you get a bit older, then <laughs> you start to know that right. things are a bit different. But, but at that time, just intuitively, I thought, well, it's not at all like... Uh, you know, uh, I listened to also to Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock and these people, the uh, jazz musicians that, that uh, had complex rhythms, complex harmonies. And I thought also that when I listened to Mozart, for example, I, I didn't hear, let's say, my own world, uh, you know, of difficult, of uh, busy uh, crossroads or, or fast planes or whatever, I don't know. But uh, it, it was different to me. It really sounded like a different era, this music. And I was more into music of, well, what I, what I heard around me. So um, I decided at 14 uh, to, to, uh, to study harmony books too, because I thought well, I didn't know anything about harmony. And if I know something about classical harmony, then I'm sure I will understand why Mozart is such a genius. Uh, so uh, I studied it and I thought it was all fine. But then the l last chapter was about 12 tone music, the, the music that Schoenberg and Webern used, uh, in which one pitch is not repeated unless uh, the other 11 have been, uh, have been played uh, within the octave. And I thought that was actually <laughs> much more uh, interesting than, than the traditional <laughs> harmony that was the last, last chapter. Was oh, so um, uh, I thought that should be the music that I hear from, let's say, Chicory or something, the free jazz people. That must be interesting. I didn't understand anything of that music, but I thought at least, well, it's mathematical. Now it makes sense. So I went to the library and I heard that it would be Arnold Schoenberg was one of the major exponents of that uh, school and Anton Webern. Uh, and I came home with one score by Schoenberg, uh, Opus 19, which I really thought was amazing because uh, all the silences and... Those are the little piano pieces. Yeah, little piano pieces uh, and the, the dissonance. And I thought, you know, I was in puberty and then you, were, you, you, uh, you are th asking yourself, who are you? And, and you try to identify yourself, basically. And I heard all the doubts and the uncertainties in this music by Schoenberg and all the silences. And I thought, this, this person f really communicates to me in that sense. So it was, I forgot about the whole rational aspect, but it was really an emotional thing that uh, appealed to me. Then the second score, I thought it was Anton Webern, but it was, I misread. Uh, I came home and it was Carl Maria von Weber, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> different. Right. So yeah. Pretty different. Yeah, exactly. So at uh, first I played it through, I thought, ah. It, I missed something. It's just, I was so disappointed, and then I, of course, I said, "Oh, I saw it was an end missing, it was the wrong one." But, uh, <laughs> but so that really triggered my my uh, interest into Schoenberg, and there was the moment I really thought I want to to mu know much more about this. Uh, there's a Dutch, uh, let's say, version of Ursula Oppens, um, uh <laughs> who's called Ton Hartzuiger, uh, Dutch uh, um, pianist, pianist, pianist who plays new music, exactly yeah, yeah. a pioneer who pioneered uh, especially Dutch music, and who who, who, who pioneered into uh, Schoenberg and uh, introducing that to Dutch audiences and so I, I, I went to him uh, I was then at the time 15 and well that he, he showed me uh, well John Adams and Charles Ives and and uh, well so many Berio and uh, Boulez and all those composers and that was such a trigger for me that th that was the moment I thought okay I, I really would like to be a musician um, and since then yeah I, I do play uh, all styles, basically, but I have a 70% focus on, on, on contemporary music, uh, which I like uh, very much. And usually in my programming, uh, at, uh, let's say, in Europe, I try to have, um, uh, I, I like to have, let's say, a build-up of, for example, starting late least, uh, which is al almost going atonal, uh, through through Schoenberg uh, and then up till, up till now, so people can hear a real line. And, and notice that actually it's not such strange music at all, and it's not coming from far out space, far outer space, or something. But it's really uh, made by composers and very logical extension of all the developments in in the whole classical history, classical music history. Right. Um, and and then mm. and then sort of 
Well, so this concert you're saying is not, I mean, it's Dutch and American, and I heard you before doing Dutch and American, but that's not, I mean, you do sort of a fuller repertoire of 20th yeah. century, I mean, European th stuff th too. That's right, yes, yeah, yeah. definitely, right. yeah. Yeah, I think it w for me it would be a bit uh, one-sided to do only contemporary music. Uh, uh, I mean, my, my big favorites are also uh, Debussy, Ravel. Uh, I love those very much, and uh, um, uh, and then the, ho the whole European, uh, of course, uh, literature, especially from that moment, I must admit. I'm, I still love Mozart, I still like Mozart, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I must uh -huh. admit, but You've come I to like him more, is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I came uh -huh. to like it more. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. And, and tell us maybe, I mean, not in great, great detail, because mm -hmm. we'll get lost in it, but it, but it is, it's funny, it's, um, it, they are very different worlds, like, um, obviously I know, Tons of my world is contemporary music, but when you go, you know go to Holland, I know one name or two names. Andreessen is the main name we mostly yeah. know. So put it in context a little bit. Give us a sense of the Dutch scene right right now and sort of leading up to it and the place that the Andreessen family plays in it. The Andreessen family is very big. Um, there, his father uh, was a, a composer, Hendrik, um, and he. Uh, uh, always, uh, Louis always said, "Oh, when he was when he would be asked, uh, uh, where did you learn to compose?" He said, "Well, I just actually it's hard to say the Dutch, the English expression, but I just uh, w w basically worked at my father's shop or something." Ah, you yeah. would say, you know, the just apprentice system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, um, yeah, he he had a brother also, Julian, which is uh, who is also a good composer. Unfortunately, he died very early, mm. um, but Louis became really the, in Holland the the, the well. The icon of Dutch music. Um, we used to have uh, in Dutch music. It starts, let's say, from 1910, so speaking more or less. We have uh, a composer like Willem Piper, uh, which what was very striking about a lot of Dutch music is that they were always very French-oriented in the first ah. place, and uh, not very, uh, especially after the World War, they were not very, <laughs> very German. Very German. They would have been before naturally. Yeah, but then sort of and then afterwards, that, it was yeah. complete. They completely rejected it. Um, at first, there were, let's say. Until until the Second World War, uh, there were quite uh, two camps. One would support and uh, imitate the German school, uh, l let's say Brahms and, and all those composers. Uh, uh, the other school would only be fanatically supporting uh, French music and, and trying to kind of imitate Debussy, Ravel, and, and the, the whole sound world of, of those composers. Um, after the Second World War, then things started to be more unidirectional into uh, fr French influences, I think. And um, then from, uh, I think, about the 50s, American influence. Uh, that has been very, very strong. Um, Did that come from Andreessen, mostly? Um, uh, well, not only from Andreessen, right. actually. It, it was uh, Louvendi already did that. Uh, uh, especially, I think, right. Louvendi. Well, like the piece we heard, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, because the thing is that uh, the big difference, I think, between Dutch music and, uh, of course, Holland is just a very small country, but um, com w compared uh, between uh, to, for example, French or German music, is that we never really found ourselves very comfortable in, in, in a very strict way of composing. So, uh, very bluntly said, we just think uh, that, that the French are too much in a boulet style <laughs> and very phonetically composing with mathematics and everything um, and the, well let's, let's say the Germans are too much into the Lachemann Stockhausen style so they are very consequent into what they what they what they do in, in what they want in Germany and in France generally the spectral school and everything is rather um, uh, yeah uh, very, very well done and but in, in Holland, we didn't like these systems so much. Of course, there were a couple that, uh, of composers that, that did compose in say, strict systems, but relatively speaking, we were al always interested in uh, listening to uh, uh, music from other uh, um, styles, like jazz, uh, other countries, especially also uh, non-Western music. Uh, we have this composer called Ton de Leeuw, who died, unfortunately. He's a major, other major composer, not as famous as Louis Andreessen. But he was very Im much influenced with Japanese and Indian music. Um, and I, I assume also the past, because of obviously Holland in the 15th and 16th century reigned supreme, that area, right, in terms of early yeah. music, right? Because oh that yeah. seemed to play a big role. Yeah, yes, yeah. Th yes I completely uh, didn't spe think about that, actually. But th that's very much too. Uh, we have many Dutch, uh, um, uh, like uh, the early polyphony, uh, yeah. uh, sailing, for example, is one of the big ones. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we never, well, the Dutch comp composition scene in general never uh, uh, was uh, at home with one style. We were always, we, not me, but uh, the composers yeah. were very eclectic and uh, really trying to, uh, to, to get influenced by many things and have a spontaneous kind of contemporary music scene uh, that was uh, accessible as much as possible to audiences as well. And uh, that would 
uh, be influenced by the by the spontaneity of, for example, improvised music. We uh, yeah, th we like that all, always. So if you hear Luvendi, it's always jazzy. We have Guus Janssen, who is uh, also a jazz pianist actually, who is uh, one of the major composers uh, who writes almost like written out jazz music. Uh, Louis Andrews has very jazzy components in his music. And nowadays uh, we have a, a quite, I think, like in the U.S., uh, a huge diversity of music. Uh, a, a coming a stream, a style which is coming up quite a lot is this um, uh, holy minimalism. I would say, holy minimalism. Yeah, it's called. Okay, <laughs> it's a, a separate. Oh, really? It's called that. It's, it's not yeah, I think uh, it's, it's called that. It's right. not post minimalism or some version of or what's the well. It's a kind of. It's you can you can compare it to Arvo Pärt. Oh, uh, holy as in a yeah, spiritual, a spir spiritual yeah, 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 way. Right, right, yeah. Um, so making use of, of relatively little um, tonal material, uh, um, musical materials, right. but then uh, giving it a great spiritual depth, let's say, yeah, yeah, uh, and and consonance plays then a big role. And so uh, yeah, the, the scene is quite diverse. Then we have uh, well another important composer at the moment, Michel van der A. You might have heard about it about him. Uh, he's uh, he has a contract with Boozine Hawks, just like Louis Andrews. He was a student of Louis Andrews, uh, actually like Vanessa Len, whom I, I played a piece by. Uh, they were all students of Louis Andriessen, and um, he is really a multimedia person. I mean, if you bluntly say it very... Uh, right, right. Uh, then he, he really... M most of his works are... F um, well, his most well-known works are all multimedia works with, with uh, video and, and this kind of thing. Interesting. Um, have you ever composed? Speaking of doing all this music, did you start as a composer at one uh, point? Right? Actually, uh, no, I haven't. Um, I, I, I had... Uh, well, at, at school, at the conservatory, I had to... Uh, to, to to compose things, right, right, but you didn't. I, did, I didn't. Yeah. No, no. It's no. It's too f no. I w if I would compose, I probably would just copy other people's work. I think <laughs> <laughs> honestly. <laughs> right. Well, I can picture that because you're so engaged yeah. in it. Yeah. 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 Um, any questions? Anybody? Oh, yeah, start here. Yeah, in that way, I wouldn't fall in the category. I would, and I'd, I think there's be all the room of interpretation. And even the John Adams, I mean, I, I want to ask you, but I mean, you're absolutely right that there's a body of minimalism that, that that's very true of, and some some Phil Glass and stuff, and even even Steve Reich in a way, that, that really, you know, you're supposed to really just play what's there sort of without m much interpretive um, nuance. Um, that's the sound they're looking for. But I think there's plenty, particularly by now, I mean, minimalism's been around for a, a long time. There's a pretty big body of music that manages to have that. You know, it's like, look at back in the classic, I mean, the history of, of music making is sort of a flux in that, in, in any case, too. And obviously there's some things we don't even know that much about going back to. You might make the same claim of some Baroque music that it leaves less room for interpretation than a 19th century piece. And I think at this point, there's it, it's wide open. But you're absolutely right that that's an element of it. And what, what do you think in terms of a yeah, player? Yeah. yeah, it's very true. The interesting thing, I think, is that um, if you look at the, the let's say the avant-garde composers that wrote every uh, uh, that assigned uh, a dynamic to every note or a way to to play it or articulation or whatever, it's, uh, which is you almost have to be like an, an executant, a robot yeah, yeah. to do it. That's something that uh, I think the minimalists were not uh, intending to do, but in the end, it almost got ended up, up there. Way. Yeah, and it's right. You don't have like melodies to stick to or to to uh, yeah. But, uh, but what about like take, taking your question and putting it very specifically mm -hmm. to the atoms, because yeah. that seems like that must have room. But and how does that? You know, what do you feel you have a space to do there? Yeah, actually, I think the atoms is is uh, uh, in between two worlds: the the world of let's say relatively free classical music and and the, the strict. Uh, of course, you always have to be strict. But yeah. uh, the thing is that um, uh, uh, atoms. Uh, of course, you cannot do much with with melody because. There is not a melody, really. But I think you can really look into terms of uh, uh, subtleties like sound uh, pedaling, sound coloring. Uh, that is something that is very p uh, specific in this piece and very spe specific to a pianist. Uh, I heard several recordings of it and they, I must say they sound strikingly different uh, because you can do so much in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, of, your, of your sound and with rhythms you want to, to uh, stick out, to catch your ear. Uh, and for example, when I played it, I worked quite a few times with John Adams, several works, uh, also 
concerto and other things. And uh, to my uh, surprise, uh, the first time I played it, I was pretty, let's say, mechanical. I thought I should probably play it really strict. So I did it, and he, he told me that yeah, you really have to try to change your mind and think of it as a Debussy score, so as a, as a, as a sound phenomenon, more than as a very rhythmical thing, except some passages, for example, in the end, of course. But um, So he, he had a different vision in mind, in a way, which, which surprised me, because uh, when you look at the notes, you just see a black, <laughs> black continuous thing of, of <laughs> all these notes. But then there is a quite a bit of room to actually um, shape it. And also, in terms of the... Um, the uh, yeah, let's the, the, the say the, the shape of the, the shape of the tension of the, the tension. Yeah, piece. the whole piece. Yeah. Uh, the way you can do it. For example, the middle section uh, you could play very statically. Uh, so with let's say as if time wouldn't exist and without a regular horizontal um, phrasing. So more of a sound phenomena. Or you can say I, I try to start from the first chord and build let's say a line until the pulse starts coming back. And then uh, you don't isolate the chords really, but you, you tend to play them in a successive way, as as if they would make, let's say, a storyline by themselves. So not a separate phenomena like more development music, for example, where you can just uh, concentrate on each chord. I personally, I chose for the uh, second option to to make a line. Yeah. yeah, because I think it's more of the style in, of the piece because it's so it's actually quite a romantic piece in a way, uh, oh making right. use of yeah. traditional. Not traditional, but making use of, of traditional min minimalist uh, elements. Right. Basically. Interesting. Well, and there you have even the composer asking for it. So I guess that that's interesting, right? And yeah. so you sort of play differently after you work yes. with him. Yes. Yeah, sense. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, somebody else? I see another question. The operas and big orchestra pieces, sure, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, it, it's a little bit. I think the thing is, it's a little bit daunting when you see the score, uh, because it's it's many pages of quite a big book of 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 ongoing rhythms, uh, and uh, very subtly, uh, the right and the left hand they change the order of the notes. Even though you think you hear the same pattern, it's actually changing. And it takes a while to 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 learn it, um, and it's not that easy to program it in concert halls. Um, we're very lucky to have you here. And, and oh yeah, I, <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it worked well. I also think there was something nice about having a bunch of shorter pieces, and then finally having these atoms where you sort of are lulled into this um, sort of zone. You know? Yeah. 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 So I think that worked really well. Ending yeah, with that's that great. personally. Good um, to hear. Yeah. Anybody else? Of Dutch folk music. That's folk music. Whether that's oh, an influence in the in Dutch contemporary music. Actually, to be honest, um, I haven't heard of it. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> but actually, I must say we have one uh, in in this hall in the audience, a, a very uh, uh, specialized a professor in the, in Dutch music. So that's Emil Wenikus. <laughs> Maybe I'm sorry that I'm. I'm do you know about that folk Dutch folk music? You mean that came from the national nationalist movements of that time? Then um, they felt they needed to have one. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, anybody else? Maybe one last question. Well, I'll maybe I'll ask it then. Um, let me ask you. Um, you are also a pilot. This is a very different. <laughs> it's very question, different. But for some reason, it fascinates me that that he he does it. I wonder what's that like, and what's that does have any um, a f relationship to music? Your interest in music, concentration. Um, tell me about that. Yeah, how, and how you got you know how you yeah. got to yeah. do that. <laughs> well, it, uh, for me, that's an interesting question. Um, it's a long story, but I will try to keep it short. Um, yeah, for me it was always, I could not choose between, I mean, as a 
well, maybe many boys, they, they want to be a pilot, and I'm not an exception. <laughs> that never occurred <laughs> to me ever, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was, I, yeah, it, it's always something uh, I, I wanted to do, and, and a piano was like really something I did for hours, quite many hours a day from early age, but um, it, it really never occurred to me to be a, a professional pianist. Uh, so I want to be, a, a, well, a pilot, yes. Um, Besides that, they share the both first two letters, pianist and the pilot. I think they uh, there is more similarities. Actually, uh, at 14, I started uh, gliding and so in the gli flying gliders, um, and at that time also that was the moment that I discovered this contemporary music, and that gave me a whole yeah new sort of inspiration, and especially uh, like. Um, I was convinced that I wanted to, uh, to to perform that for people and make sure that you know uh, people would appreciate it. And I could imagine people being pretty negative about contemporary music and difficult and rational and hard to understand and not beautiful. And so I thought it's different. I should try to prove it's it's different. Um, and at the same time, I noticed that gliding. I liked it a lot, but it was actually the piano was more important. So uh, yeah, I stopped uh, flying at 16. And I completely concentrated on music. Actually, when I was studying in the States at Northwestern University with Ursula Opens, there I had finally some more free time because, uh, well, in Holland I was always doing many things, and here I didn't know so many people yet. So I was more, I had more free time, and I had more time to dive into aviation as a, let's say, uh, pastime, just magazines and things. So I was again completely, I retook this 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 uh, this hobby. Which beca I w became quite fanatic with it, and then um, uh, actually, about not so long ago, like five years ago, I took the plunge and I thought, okay, now uh, in in every respect I could could do it. I mean, uh, have a, have a pilot, uh, uh, they call that um, uh, studies, how do you, uh, oh, yeah. cor sure. course, or I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, got my PPL, private pilot license, and um, yeah, it strikes me that, that it's very similar. Uh, it, for me, it's a way of relaxation uh, after a busy period. Is nothing better than get into your plane and uh, leave the earth, <laughs> literally. <laughs> but um, it's both things, it's psychological because, um, yeah, you obviously you, you are get loose from the ground. I mean, you, you, you soar in the air and that, that makes you feel very free. It really f frees yourself up, I think. And because you have so many things to watch and to, uh, you have to talk to air traffic and you have to watch your maps, not to bust some airspace and, and all these things and you have to, of course, to keep on flying. So um, you really tend not to think about any, let's say, daily worries or, or about your uh, concerts or whatever. So uh, it's a very good way to, to distantiate yourself from it for a while. And at the same time, it's very similar because when you give a concert or you prepare a concert, you, you have your scores and you pe prepare them really well, you, you start to, uh, to think about them. And But then, w once you're on the stage, things are always different. Right. Uh, because uh, as Frederick Jeski once told me, it all depends on the... the, the um, the position of the moon, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's kind of true, uh, and the, the 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 temperature of the hall and the, the audience and the response of the audience. Or, um, so yeah, uh, you you play different. Your, the, the acoustics, uh, the instruments, it makes that your tempos could be different. Uh, that your yeah, you suddenly get a different idea about the music. It all can happen, and the same is in the air. I mean, you prepared your flight. You know which courses to fly. You know the effects of the wind. Uh, which you calculated, uh, y you submitted, uh, submitted your flight plan, everything. But when you're in the air, then suddenly the wind seems to have changed. And there's other traffic in your environment that makes you have to divert and all these things. So uh, on the spot, it is uh, in the air or on the in, in, uh, yeah, in the concert hall, you have to make different decisions. And it all, it's all influenced by what you notice at that moment. And then um, if you have a really nice landing and nice greaser at the end, you feel really good. And it's a bit the same as, you know, when you, you feel Very you have made, did a good concert. Which, which you did. Thank and you. This, this <laughs> feels like a perfect ending there. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.